The following is a special video presentation of the Hennepin County Library. Hi, welcome to a discussion with Russell Banks, author of Rule of the Bone. I'm Eileen Cavanaugh from the Hennepin County Library Program Office. Russell, welcome to the program. Thanks, Eileen. The book Rule of the Bone is a coming-of-age story, I would guess, a story about a 14-year-old boy named Chappie mm -hmm. who uh, enters a life of minor crime and tries to find family and community and, and finally uh, does come to find himself, at least. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I have to tell you that I burned my whole dinner one night, becoming so absorbed in Rule of the Well, bone. that's nice. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry for your dinner, but that's very nice. Uh, and what I found, what, what for me made it a stunning novel was the fact that it evoked such strong feelings mm -hmm. in the reader. Mm -hmm. When I read the first chapter, as I often, you know, have the first chapter of 25 books going right. um, to see if I really feel like reading any further. When I read the first chapter, I thought I could wring that kid's neck. Right. And, and I knew that I had to read on further and, and <laughs> see why I felt so strongly <laughs> about this kid. And maybe it's because I'm a parent myself. But well, also, he's, uh, he's testing the, uh, the reader, I suppose, in the same way that a kid uh, tests. Uh, any adult uh, first encountered, uh, you know, there's a certain kind of sullenness and uh, apparent uh, callowness uh, in his in his presentation at the in the opening chapters, and as he gradually um, obtains the readers or listeners' trust, I mean, it's a told story, not a written story, quite. Um, then I think he starts to become more. Um, self-revealing and more reflective and more self-questioning and, and, and most people have said that to me that uh, the, the first couple of chapters he he is one of those kids that you see in the malls you see on the streets you know with the with the mohawk and the nose rings and he's kind of in the baggy pants and the big sneakers and he's the kind of kid you just who looks at you in a kind of suspicious and sullen way and, and most adults kind of avert their gaze and, and, and in a way make him invisible um, and he is one of those kids, and, uh, and so it takes a while for him to get us over our prejudices and, and, um, and biases, uh, in a way. I mean, he knows they're there, so uh, he's trying to, uh, to test us the first uh, opening pages, I think, in a way. Well, and in a way, I in Chapter 1, we don't know about his parents. Right. Uh, right. We, we think they yeah. might be perfectly ordinary right, for all right. we know. Right, and he reveals a little bit of the time, time as he goes along, yeah. And I didn't want to put it right up front, uh, um, in the fact that he's, he's uh, been abused by his father and, and uh, his stepfather. I didn't want to put that right up front either because it would have um, flipped the weight of the story entirely. Then it would have become a kind of domestic drama about sexual abuse. And, um, and I was after something else, really, uh, more of a social satire and a tall tale there were, uh, and a picaresque kind of novel that I was interested in writing. And so I had to uh, withhold, or he had to withhold that information um, until fairly far down, because it wasn't the central fact mm -hmm. in his life, really. I mean, it was certainly a significant fact, and it had mm -hmm. a great deal to do with his um, um, deep uh, uh, mistrust of adults, and um, in particular his, uh, his stepfather. But uh, but it wasn't the central fact in his life, as I think for for you know for a number. And it was of part of, of the layering kind of of his right. character that we, right. it's almost as if we see a peeling away of the right. onion. And he's in a process of self-discovery uh -huh. too. I mean, he he doesn't when he begins talking know everything about himself. I mean, he, he he keeps on saying maybe I think this, maybe I think that, maybe this is right, maybe I made a mistake years ago. He, he's not clear and and, and who is. Really, but as he goes along, he gradually comes to uh, to greater and greater degree of self uh, understanding. And part of his guide to self understanding is the Rastafarian who right, enters right. his life a little right. later on in the book in the right. school bus. Right. Uh, I, I'm wondering if he's drawn to the Rastafarian's philosophy because it's foreign and exciting and new to him, or whether it offers him something that he's never had before. The Rastafarian uses terms like praise and joy a lot, yeah, which yeah. must have been a whole new world yeah, yeah. to poor Chappie. Give praise and thanks, he <laughs> says. Give praise and thanks. And, uh, 
the idea of giving praise and thanks mm -hmm. is, a, is a bit of a foreign one to this uh, <laughs> lower middle class uh, white boy from upstate New York who's, who feels cast out. Uh, praise and thanks for what, you know? And uh, yeah, he has, to, he has to learn that. I think one of the things that attract him to, um, I mean, he, he's like all kids, really. I mean, he's looking for, he, there's a kind of a universal need uh, in, in, in children and adolescents, which is very basic and it doesn't change whether you know, the nuclear family explodes and, or not. I mean, you still, ne th those needs go, are 50,000 years old, I mean, to be for a child. Uh, to, it's, it's biological almost. I mean, you need to be protected and because you're weak and vulnerable. You need to be instructed because you're ignorant of the ways of the world and you have no power in it. And you need to be respected for yourself and, um, and uh, because you're a human being and, uh, and an individual and uh, you have consciousness. And um, families, you know, conventionally and traditionally have been the, the means to, to meet those needs, have had the means and ways to meet those needs. Um, but in the, um, you know, in the, the breakup of the nuclear family, which is now uh, the rule and not the exception um, in our culture, um, kids have to start or ha are increasingly looking elsewhere to meet those needs. Well, and there's this whole question of, of from, from my generation, we said children learn their values yeah. from not only parents, but good adult role models right. in their life. Right. And in Chappie's life, uh, who we should say later becomes Bone, uh, there are no really good adult role models. Even the Rastafarian is not, you Well, know. he's a mixed <laughs> character like every, <laughs> I'm sure even the, the good adult role models uh, are, uh, are mixed as well at best. I mean, the, 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 that's part of the process of growing up is learning to love somebody with weak, who has weaknesses um, and uh, who is a role model as well. But yeah, he has to learn to, uh, he has to find um, protection and, and instruction and, and, uh, and love really uh, outside the, um, the conventional sources, outside the world that has been given him. And, and he tries, you know, as most kids do, I mean, who, are, who are hit the streets or for one reason or other fall through the cracks. He, um, they, they build a family, they find a family elsewhere. They, they go elsewhere for that. I mean, he goes to, he falls in with a motorcycle gang and then he ends up um, with the Bong brothers at this abandoned school bus and then he hooks up with, uh, with this uh, escaped um, migrant apple picker from Jamaica who is also a kind of shaman figure and a bit of a rascal and a kind of a shady figure in his own right too. And but all of these are in some way unsatisfactory for him so he keeps moving on. Yeah, yeah. Uh, which I, I guess says something universal too about our search, all of our search for family and our community. Well, we have to move on. We have really to Really it's change it. or die and, and uh, he, can't, uh, he can't go backwards. He can't become a child again. Uh, he has to go forward. And, um, and, 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 you know, he compresses into one year. The, the book covers, uh, the story is, is basically about one year of his life, and he compresses into that one year um, through the magical means of fiction um, uh, what most of us probably go through, if we're lucky, in uh, 20 or 25 years, uh, the movement from child to adult, uh, adulthood. Um, and he has to uh, use, uh, in order to achieve that, that fast, uh, some fairly extreme means. There's an interesting little side bit that I think says something about Chappie's character and the little girl that joins them mm -hmm. in the in the bus, and uh, uh, he he makes every effort to see that she's returned eventually to her mother. But that's mm -hmm. that's a very ambiguous, given his own background mm -hmm. with his mother. Well, uh, at that point, yeah, he, he believes. Well, any mother is better than no <laughs> mother at all. He says, and and uh, he wants very much to uh, to believe in the myth of family. I think that 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 the the deep insight he has early on is that, uh, that there's a vast, uh, a very wide gap between the myth of family on the one hand and the reality on the other. And uh, the one of the, the, the almost uh, skitzy way we, 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 we talk in about family values and, and, and family life today is, is, a, is a way of denying that gap in that reality. He, he intuits that reality is there, but he's not happy with that. And, and he makes these kind of desperate uh, lurching moves toward uh, uh, claiming um, um, the myth every now and then. And, and he's implicated every time he does it, um, he, um, it ends up um, finally disillusioning him. I mean, he's implicated in what happens to Rose. Mm -hmm. He can't mm -hmm. fully protect her because he goes ahead and, 
and believes in that myth that um, you know no mo uh, any mother is better than no mother at all. Mm -hmm. um, or when he himself tries to go back home again, um, mm -hmm. back to his uh, to his uh, stepfather and his mother. Or when he searches on and and finds uh, uh, his uh, and tries to take up with his real father, his, his genetic father, mm -hmm. and. Uh, uh, this, he's still groping after that uh, that myth. That's a powerful myth, mm -hmm. you know. It's 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 ancient and it ha exerts a tremendous amount of power over our imaginations. Do you think that some homeless kids are better off on the streets than they are with neglectful parents? Well, it's it's. I don't think you know, I can't think about it in an either or kind of um, uh, situation. I mean, it's so hypothetical. And, um, there probably are cases, I'm sure there are cases, where they're better off on the streets than they are with their parents. Uh, I mean, I don't agree with Chappie that any mother is better than no mother at all, or any father is better than no father at all. I really don't. I think some are positively um, uh, malignant, and, uh, and that kids can, in many ways, uh, help themselves. The real problem is, is that is economic in a way. When you, when, well for kids, uh, I mean, the most immediate and pressing problem for them, the greatest danger to them, I think, uh, on the streets is that um, is that when you um, when you are either rejected by or abandoned or otherwise have unavailable to you your parents' economy, um, then you've only got the economy of the streets. And in late 20th century America, the economy of the streets is sex and drugs, mm -hmm. and there isn't any other way for a kid mm -hmm. to keep from ending up, you know, starving under a culvert somewhere. Um, and so, um, so that's that's where they're going to go, and that's dangerous. That kills people. Uh, literally. You know. It also sort of speaks about that's the education of the streets and mm -hmm. compared with formal education uh, that's going on in our schools, mm -hmm. uh, it's interesting to me that Chappie is sort of part of this whole group of kids that reject formal education, mm -hmm. at least as it's offered mm -hmm. in, mm -hmm. in their terms. And, and yet there are a lot of kids today that com come from, quote, good families mm -hmm. who are also rejecting formal education and, and moving onto mm -hmm. the streets, uh, mm -hmm. too, even mm -hmm. though they have no economic need to do so. Yeah, it's, um, it's hard to know who's rejecting whom there, though. Sometimes I wonder if the kids are rejecting the school system or is the school it's rejecting good. them and, and basically regarding them as disposable. And, uh, and I think an awful lot of kids... I mean, we treat them as if they're making these big existential decisions about their futures, and, um, and, and in fact, maybe we're just casting, as a society or as a culture, we're, uh, we're making the decisions unconsciously and casting them out because we're unable and unwilling to take the responsibility for, uh, for their care and their protection as, and a, as a society. And we don't know what works. And as Chappie mm -hmm. says, adults no, no, don't know how kids think. They don't know how kids think, right. Uh, which is interesting. I wonder about your thoughts about that since we all were kids. How come we lose our ability to, to, to know how kids think? Is it a generational thing? Maybe too painful <laughs> 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 to remember. <laughs> I don't know. It's, it's, I'm one of those people who thinks kids have a really um, steady uh, uh, and clear um, magnetically um, polarized moral compass, that, that, that it's pretty steady, and that um, it slowly, as you become an adult, uh, gets wobbled off true north and, and to a degree, and that really it's, it's the people at the top of the uh, pecking order who tend to not know right from wrong. You know, it's all those white-collar <laughs> criminals who don't believe they were doing anything wrong um, and can't believe it, can't understand it. Uh, they're the ones that don't know right from wrong. Kids tend to know right from wrong very clearly, I think. Um, so I, I'm... I'm I'm not so uh, uh, sure that, that uh, our failure, I think uh, our failure to remember clearly what it was like to be 12, 13, 14 years old has a lot to do with a certain amount of shame that we've, we, we knew then what was right and wrong and we've, and we've lost that uh, in many ways. And I don't think it's just a failure of memory. On the other hand, novelists tend to have a kind of, um, I think arrested development in some ways. It's not that difficult. Most of the novelists I know, and I include myself, I guess, um, have a um, uh, can click rather quickly back to the emotional uh, state of adolescence, and, and they can remember quite vividly and tend to act out the rest of their life most of the dramas that that um, that they uh, first uh, experienced and imagined as adolescents. So it wasn't all that hard for me to get into Chappie's head um, uh, once I. Uh, determined that I wanted to look at the world for a year and a half or so of my life from the point of view of a turbulent, troubled, uh, angry 14-year-old boy. Um, and um, 
and once I got there, I I, uh, I, uh, I found it, you know, a, a very uh, revealing and 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 uh, challenging and, and instructive experience. Well, you've said elsewhere that your novels are the themes of your novels are Russell Banks searching for his father. Yeah, well, I think I may have been a little bit <laughs> <laughs> ironic and self-mocking there because it does sometimes seem that I look at it, I say, my God, haven't I got anything else to write about? <laughs> yet, yet it, yeah. it makes a compelling story, yeah. even though when you, even though you've used yeah. it in yeah. more than one book. Well, it's a Homeric story. It's one of the mm -hmm. oldest stories in the in uh, in the West. I think uh, uh, as well. I mean, it's 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 a, it's an old story. That's it's probably in the DNA or something, and it's so basic. Uh, and uh, and I do end up, I guess, retelling it. There are certain obsessive themes that you keep going. One writer always goes back to. Anyhow, I think uh, was it Flannery O'Connor said that by the age of fourteen, you've experienced already everything you need to know uh, to write, spend the rest of your life writing. Yeah. And and uh, like like the author who says that everything I knew I learned in kindergarten, <laughs> in kindergarten <laughs> even right, right. younger age. Right, right. Now everything I learned, I, uh, everything I needed to know, I think I learned by the time I was in high school. But I don't know if I say kindergarten. Well, this is a book about the loss of innocence too, and 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 mm -hmm. Chappie makes uh, has many losses mm -hmm. along those mm -hmm. lines. Mm -hmm. I'm wondering what the connection is maybe between adolescence and maturity. Is maturity just a matter of lots more losses of innocence? Hmm. Well, he goes through a, a series of, I guess I think of them as crossings, uh, rites of passage maybe. Uh, and some of them are more dramatic and, and uh, have larger implications than others. Some are small and, and, uh, and, and easily processed and so forth. Um, and, um, and I think each of these passages lead him to a greater understanding uh, and, a, and a, a clearer understanding of um, of his relation to the larger world around him, um, it's uh, you know the, he manages to uh, um, acquire and through that understanding acquire a, uh, a greater amount of power in that relationship too. He's able to and in reality his world does enlarge. Yeah, oh, it, it does literally. Yeah, quite literally, it starts to expand out from this small town in upstate New York into the malls of Plattsburgh, and then from there out into the big world in Jamaica and so forth. And by the end, he's lighting out for the territory on a on a boat, um, and he does gain um, at each at each of these crossings. Um, I think what we need as adults. Uh, so I guess by that, yes, maturity is is probably a, a good term. Um, by the end, I feel he has acquired um, what I, w I have four children. What I would love my four children to have acquired and think they have now that they're in their twenties. Um, he has an ability to love other people, and he loves the truth. He's managed to sustain that into adult or into his into his own uh, uh, near adult life, um, and use them uh, his l ability to love other people and and to love the truth um, to. Um, to control his own destiny to a considerable degree, he has a skill, and he, he, he's a cook. He, uh, he he can control his own economy now. Um, he's not dependent on either the economy of the parents or the economy of the streets. He's he can grow ganja plants and. To he's make a good him, the gardener. ultimate he's irony <laughs> is that he uses, doesn't he use uh, Ronald Reagan's uh, camouflage right. from Grenada right. to <laughs> shade the. Right. <laughs> yes, he remembered that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yes, he can put almost anything to good use. But he's a smart kid now, and he's in charge of his own um, destiny to a considerable degree. Uh, and that's really all you want for a mature person um, that they, uh, you know, they have those capacities and, uh, and, and basic skills. Are you saying that? We almost need a certain amount of difficulty in our life to come to that kind of. Maturity. Well, no, I wouldn't say we need it. I guess it's probably not available without going through a lot of difficulty. Um, I can't imagine um, obtaining that, especially in, in, in a, as uh, um, rejecting a society as we have uh, regarding children. Um, irresponsible, I should say, a society as we have regarding children. Um, I think that in order to obtain that, those capacities, yeah, you have to go through an awful lot of turmoil and difficulty. It's not easily got in this world. You know, it's not easily got in the schools. It's not easily got at home. It's not easily got in the streets. Um, you know, we 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 scratch our heads and 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 uh, and wonder why these kids. Uh, you know, don't um, have these, uh, or they don't seem to have these capacities. Why they seem so alienated and angry and self-destructive? 
um, when, uh, what the hell, we, we've been using um, television to, uh, to babysit them for the last 25 years. And, uh, and, and not very quality television. At well, it's, uh, we've turned them into a consumer group. Uh, instead of protecting them from an amoral, consumer-driven economy, we've, uh, we've uh, colonized them and, uh, with it. And, uh, you know, we, we, we've completely objectified them as consumers. You know, it's, not, it's not be like Dad, it's be like Mike. And, uh, and um, instead, uh, uh, and this is kind of, of shown in, in the, the mall mentality. Yeah, yes, yeah, the, the franchising of the American uh, uh, family in a way. Yeah, no, it's, it's, kind of, it's something dark happened, I think, in the last uh, 40 years in small increments so that we're barely aware that it was happening. And uh, it's happened uh, over maybe, yeah, 40 years, really, since the 1950s. Um, and we're now, you know, about the third generation into it, uh, where in some awful way we, uh, we, we abdicated uh, basic responsibilities uh, toward our children. And, uh, you know, I have my own theory about this, and, and, uh, and I think it's, it's, it's very related to our um, um, having in the 1950s uh, welcomed into the, um, the American home. Um, the uh, the most powerful selling tool known to man. Uh, we we brought that blue eye, that magical blue eye, in, and sat it down in the middle of the living room. And you the know, altar of the gods. The altar of the gods. You know, I mean, historically, uh, we've always been able to um, slam the door in a salesman's foot. You know, and and and, and, you, and the home was had a, had a kind of sanctity to it with regard to the so-called free economy, the the consumer-driven. Hucksterism of our economy, it's, which is amoral and, 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 and turns everybody into customers and, 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 and doesn't deal with them as human beings. And so we've always had the home to kind of exclude that and to protect, use the, the, the home to protect the, the weakest members of our society who's, who, who are least able to resist the blandishments of the huckster until we, we invited the television in. And, and, uh, and, and bit by bit, uh, we've allowed the, the, the television, which exists solely for the purpose, except, of course, in circumstances like this, but, <laughs> but really, I mean, commercial television exists for the sole purpose of selling consumer goods. It doesn't exist for any other reason. Sports, I mean, television doesn't exist to show sports events. Sports events exist in order to sell beer. And most, almost all the programming on commercial And to TV evade exists. the advertising of cigarettes. <laughs> exactly, exactly. <laughs> And so now we have children watching television on average seven hours a day. A third of the kids in America have their own TV set in their bedroom. The average kid of five years old, I read the other day, watches, has watched 2,000 hours of television. I mean, I don't want to just beat on this one okay. stick, but on this one horse, but it's, it's, uh, it's, a, it's a significant fact, and it's, it's, um, it's got an awful lot to do with, uh, with the kind of social psychosis that we're talking about here. And we're getting bigger and better sets, and yeah. they're taking up more room oh, in our yeah. homes. Oh, and, yeah. and they're putting them into the schools. I mean, the, the, mm -hmm. uh, the, uh, they want to beam um, um, TVs into, uh, TV programming into the school, and they'll provide all kinds of, uh, of uh, television equipment and video equipment to the schools if the schools will only accept a few ads, ads. <laughs> right? And or there beamed you go. right toward it. Yeah, everything. I mean, it's like a junkie standing at a schoolyard gate offering a little free, mm -hmm. you know, a free taste. and, and uh, mm -hmm. And um, if you'll just let me, you know, come inside the schoolyard. Well, going back to uh, Chappie. <laughs> I didn't mean to get off on that. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> he, uh, I want to stay with this wonderful sure. story. Uh, he goes to Jamaica and he says an interesting thing, or at least I found this interesting. He said, if you change the way you look on the outside, this is after he took off his nose ring and, yeah. his mo and, c and let his mohawk grow. Right. Uh, if you take, if you change the way you look on the outside, you feel different on yeah. the inside. I yeah. thought that was an interesting comment from Chappie and, and maybe from adolescents in general, mm -hmm. in that I thought that adolescents were perturbed by adults who didn't look at the real person. Well, I think that's, yeah. yeah. A and that they yeah. consider these things sort of external, and why are, you, yeah. why are you bothered by the way I dress or look because it's the real me that... Right. Kind of Chappie seems to say something different. Yeah, I think he's having some insight there into um, the feeling that, uh, or the, maybe the fact that the only thing um, he and, and kids like him uh, have any power over or any control over is their body. Um, and, um, and I think he might be talking about, you know, tattooing and body mutilation and 
uh, extreme uh, kind of hair and um, the motorcycle and gang. And tattoo. Yeah, I mean, uh, actually, I think he makes that statement where he's just gotten the crossbones tattoo, and, and it makes him feel different. And and uh, and there's some kind of sense that gee, it makes you feel like I have a little power here. Mm -hmm. um, I, I remember reading about and and, uh, and reflecting on um, on uh, eating disorders and kids, bulimia and anorexia and um, and one of the theories uh, regarding it is that um, that it's 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 an exercise of power um, over the only thing the person feels she has any power over it's usually female is uh, is her body if she can make it go get smaller and smaller and smaller and, and, and bigger and bigger and bigger but it's like a, you know it's something you can control and, you can, and it's really an expression, in some ways, of your lack of control of, over anything else in your life. You're, you know, that's controlled by other people, other forces. Uh, you're, you're just, in some ways, powerless. So I think that's what he's referring to there. In some ways, he's an insight. Gee, if I change how I look on the outside, it changes how I feel on the inside. Yeah. Well, in the two minutes we have left, I want to save a little bit of time to ask you what you're working on next. Well, it's it's also what I was working on before. Um, what I'm working on next is is uh, is a, trying to finish a book that I, I uh, abandoned to write this book uh, about five years ago. I started writing a, a historical novel about um, based on the life of uh, the abolitionist John Brown and uh, of Harpers Ferry, who's um, actually buried just down the road from my house in upstate New York, where he had a farm, and and uh, he and, and eleven others. Uh, from the Harper's Ferry, f ferry uh, raid who were either killed in the raid or executed afterwards. Their bodies were brought back up and buried there. So it's a very ghostly presence down the road. And uh, He's kind of haunted me anyhow since my college days. And so um, I worked on this novel, as I say, for about five years, since what, 1990 really I started in uh, when I finished The Sweet Hereafter. And, um, and um, it became a kind of 900-page <laughs> monster of a book. and I. I felt uh, stymied by it, and I parked it for a year and a half to write this, and now I'm eager to get back to it. So how does a novelist make those decisions to, to set something aside? In desperation, <laughs> I think. <laughs> uh, not a rational decision. It's just, my God, I can't think of what to do with this thing today. I think I'll do something else, is what you do. Also, uh, the world of, of Chappie and, and uh, homeless kids, and well, kids generally, had been kind of creeping into my consciousness uh, more and more. Um, I'd been teaching a workshop at a prison in upstate New York and mostly uh, dealing with uh, drug dealers, young drug, 18 to 22 year old kids who were drug dealers for the most part. And they were nonviolent felons. And I'd been getting into their lives and their stories and hearing their stories. And, and they had become um, increasingly significant to me and, and with large implications. And so I was starting to look at the world through that angle for a while, and I wanted to follow that out. Well, Russell, thank you for your timely story. I'm so glad you interrupted John Brown's story <laughs> to write this. Well, thank you. Thank you. presentation of the Hennepin County Library.